again, everyone. Once again, if you have uh, not registered for this webinar, please make use of the link and QR code on the screen to complete your registration. And in a few minutes time, you will be ready to start the fifth webinar. Thank you. Like um, everyone is here, a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. To you all, I would like to say hello to our presidents of Asia TAFL, Professor Ravinder Gargesh and Professor Kalyong Lee, as well as Professor Mohanty, the 2021 Asia TAFL Conference Chair, who are also with us here today. Thank you for joining us. First of all, I would encourage you to turn on your camera so that we can see you, have some face-to-face -face time, some smiles, some eye contact, perhaps some familiar faces mm -hmm. whom we might have bumped into at some conference in the past. So please turn on your camera and I hope you are comfortable with that. Good day to all of you once again. It's such a great pleasure for me to be here and to have this opportunity to welcome all of you to the fifth and last webinar for the year 2021. My name is Tanbir Kaur. I'm a lecturer at the Institute of Teacher Education International Languages Campus here in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and one of the committee members of Asia TAFL webinar series 2021. Today, I am the MC for this webinar, and I'll be with you throughout the program. I am so thrilled to let you know that there are more than 900 people from 50 countries around the world who registered their interest in attending this webinar. We are truly a global presence and we are certainly proud to be part of this diverse and vibrant ELT community that welcomes everyone irrespective of who they are and where they come from. The topic for today is ELT research in the new normal. And we have three guest speakers who are experts in their own fields and are passionate about sharing their expertise and experiences with ELT research in the new normal. Before we proceed, we would like to start with a short video clip on the Asia TAFL Professional Network Webinar Series 2021. Let's watch that together. of Asia TAFL has only been through its annual conferences and through its publications in the Journal of Asia TAFL and through the Asia TAFL book series. This webinar series will provide greater visibility all the year round to Asia TAFL. Asia TAFL webinar series is a realization of aspiration 
to meeting together for academic development and promoting friendship despite this pandemic. Uh, Professor Kanakumaran Subramaniam has initiated this project and he has put lots of efforts on this. His devotion should be appreciated. I hope that everyone participating in the webinar series will get engaged and further stimulated in each webinar. Thank you very much to the technical team for playing this inspiring clip. And yes, let's support our professional community together. Now, I would like to invite Professor Kel Yong Lee to deliver the welcome speech. Please welcome Professor Kel Yong Lee. Hello, hi everyone. It's great to see you all here in this webinar. I've heard that, um, um, you know, this is the uh, the fifth webinar series this year. Um, you know, I think that it was last November or December when we were planning to start a webinar series. We really did not expect that this webinar series would be such a successful you know, program like this. I've heard that um, you know, more than almost 1,000, sometimes more than 1,000, registrants in each webinar every month. I think this is a huge number of people. And I thought about this, what would be the reasons why this webinar series attracted so many people like this? Uh, I came to think about a few reasons. The first reason would be that um, because of the pandemic, you know, people do not often get together but they are in strong need of getting together to share the ideas and thoughts as a professionals. But um, they found that um, you know, online meeting would be a great chance for them to get together even in the pandemic. So um, webinar is a really good place to do it. And the second reason would be that um, unlike the normal conference, that we had before the pandemic, where we had to be there physically for whole day or sometimes three days in a row. In the webinar, we just stayed at home and but we still can you know, communicate with uh, people and share our ideas. So this is also a very good you know, the opportunity for us to get together. So it's very convenient and also simple. At the same time, we can learn many things from the uh, experts who are serving as the panelists in each uh, uh, webinar, right? And the third reason would be that I think this is one of the possible reasons. That is, committee members, webinar committee members are working so hard enough for people to get interested in this webinar. They have put lots of energy and time for making this webinar possible. So without them, you know, we could not enjoy this webinar. And the last, the last but the least, not the least, is that um, it is each one of you who is participating right now in this webinar series. With your sincere, and enthusiastic participation, we can continue this webinar series. I'm very truly grateful to all of you for your active participation. And today, I've learned that there are four, there are four uh, experts who are invited in this webinar. I'd like to call out their names one by one. Dr. Junzi Gabin Wu from China and Dr. Shahid 
Abraul Hansan, Hassan from Canada, and Mr. Lee Kwan Ik from Australia, and Mrs. Than Beer Kawasekon from Malaysia. And I'm sure that they, their expertise will stimulate us to broaden our horizons and to expand our knowledge. Again, I'd like to thank all the webinar team members for their hard work on this. I'd like to mention their names. Professor Pragasip, a city to call the chair, and uh, the Professor Chai Sun Hyu, uh, the director, and Professor uh, Dr. Sabi, Sabi Khan, right? Sabi Khan Bayfran, the, uh, the secretary, and all other members. Their hard work is really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President, uh, Professor Kil Yong Lee, for your warm welcome. Next, I would like to invite Professor Mohanty, um, the 2021 Asia TAFL Conference Chair, to give a short speech on the upcoming Asia TAFL Conference. Professor Mohanty. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning here in India. Um, no, it should be good afternoon because it's past 12. Yeah, yeah. I should share the screen. Just a minute, I'm sorry. Not complete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as you can see, uh, the 19th Asia TEFL International Conference, we are. Um, can you see that? Is it visible now? Yes. Yes, visible. Yeah. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, it will be held in Delhi. Uh, and, uh, and from 3rd to 5th uh, December 2021, it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, the next one, uh, the venue is Indian Council of Social Science Research. Indian Council of Social Science Research, which is abbreviated as ICSSR, was established in 1969. This is the venue, and we must know what kind of venue we have by the government of India to promote research in social sciences in the country. Uh, you can treat it as the counterpart of, uh, you know, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, which is called CSIR. Um, and it's a government of India Institute. And the, this is the, if you can see, this is the building. You know, it has very nice uh, conference hall and guest houses, all sorts of facilities, because it's a premier institute of the government of India. And it is uh, under the Ministry of Education, government of India. It shares the boundary, of course, I'm sure most of you have heard about the Jawahal Nail Nehru University at Delhi. And it shares the boundary. It's on the same campus, in fact, you know, and uh, the location has very good accommodation facilities all around. There are many hotels and, of course, this conference is going to be online. Um, had it been on site, you know, we would have uh, been no problem because there are good hotels all around. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, we had some issues, small issues about registration. Uh, you know, I, of course, Professor Ju Kim Park told me in the beginning that registration is the most difficult thing. And she cautioned me and we um, tried our best, but even then there are issues. And, uh, but we uh, devised a way, we uh, requested the participants who were not able to upload their documents, you know, uh, we requested them send your mail to us with the details and we'll do everything and after that we received no complaints and it has worked very well and we are now currently drafting how to prepare the videos 
uh, the, I mean, because we'll request each participant to send us a video so that, uh, beg your pardon? We'll request each participant to send us a video of their presentation. And this draft will be uploaded and the, uh, the draft that we are preparing on the website within a few days. And once the registration process is over, we'll finalize that. And every participant uh, has to, uh, we'll give a link uh, to be uh, uploaded, I'm aware they can upload. And the, our, our presentation schedule is also getting ready. And it's a kind of tentative one. Once we get all the registrations, then we can prepare their final list. And of course, we'll share it first with our colleagues and who are you know, uh, helping me a lot, uh, both the presidents, um, um, Professor Ju King Park, and uh, others who whichever is helping us, we'll share it with them. Then once it is finalized, we'll upload that. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. No, we are, no, wait, wait. Uh, uh, we are planning Sorry. to showcase some Indian cultural events on the final day. So I, I'm sure, you know, we'll be, because all of you know that India is a very pluralistic country with all sorts of traditions. And we have uh, very performance and also very, very, you know, exciting, colorful, and very different. We'll do those things. So thank you, um, Dr. Tanvir Sekhar. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Mohanty, <clears throat> for sharing the information about the conference. Next, I would like to invite uh, Professor Gargesh to give us more information about the upcoming Asia TEFL conference. Let's give the floor to Professor Gargesh. Thank you very much, Sandeer. Uh, Professor Mohanty has, uh, by and large, stated the facts. But yes, the initial venue was Marriott Hotel, which we had to cancel. Number one, it was very expensive, and then it, there was a pandemic. So we had to go online only, and therefore we canceled the hotel and went down to ICSSR, which, an, which is an excellent venue. And I thank Professor Mohanty for having arranged this venue. He's been very, he's been instrumental in many things. Now, the only thing that left is that we will be sharing with you the platform from where the videos will be shared. The platform is going to be very important from where we're going to upload the videos and uh, play the videos, the parallel sessions, that is also going to be taken care of. We'll explore it this month. And I will also be in Delhi uh, early next month and we'll carry it forward. I don't think so there will be any hitch. All the hitches that were there are things of the past. Well, problems have been there, but definitely they're not signs, they're guidelines. So taking them as guidelines, we're moving forward. And Professor Mahanti and his team are doing very well. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy personally, the way they are moving fast at a good pace. And uh, I think things will be very good. By the middle of November, you will realize that everything is absolutely done. We will rehearse everything before the end of November. So when we have December, we'll be finally ready, all prepared, all prepared, everything, everything will be done. So we'll hope to see you all online. Of course, it would have been a pleasure to host you in Delhi. We had held the conference in Delhi in 2012. This is the second one. It would have been definitely better, big difference between 2012 and 2021, world of a difference in Delhi and its uh, infrastructure. It would have been a great experience had, you, had we been able to host you in Delhi, it would have been wonderful. Anyway, our loss, it's our loss. And maybe we'll be able to fulfill it some other time. Thank you very much. And before I leave, of course, I would like to say one word. Professor Lee has already congratulated, welcomed. About the webinar, I would like to say something. With just a few sentences. Wonderful. Professor Ghana's vision has come to light. It's been fruitful, wonderful experience right through. And I know that by the time this webinar will be over, the last one, I will definitely say things won are done. Joy's soul lies in the doing. And Professor Prague and his team have done it. <laughs> And I would definitely say congratulations after the webinar. You can keep it on record, freeze it now, unfreeze it after the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gargesh, um, for the updates on the Asia Tempo Conference. Thank you. Uh, please allow me to make a few more announcements before I introduce the moderator. 
once again. A gentle reminder to those who have not registered for this webinar, please do so. This will be part of our database purposes, so it will be appreciated if you could sign in using the link and the QR code here. Thank you, it's on the screen right now. Please be informed that this Zoom platform is only available for a maximum of 500 participants. For those of you who accidentally log out due to technical or other issue, please note that you may not be able to log back in if we reach our 500 participants uh, limit. Okay, now regarding uh, your questions for our speakers today, during the session, please send your questions via the online question platform called Mentimeter. Please scan the QR code on the screen or you can make use of the chat room. You will select your questions and have our speakers answer your questions during the Q&A session. Also, I would like to address a very important issue for everyone here. We are delighted to tell you that we will provide an e-certificate for everyone who is attending this webinar. Therefore, you will need to complete an e-form. We will display a slide at the end of this webinar where you can use the link or scan the QR code to fill in your form. Not to worry, we will remind you about this later. Let's enjoy the webinar first. Now, I would like to give the floor to the moderator for today, Dr. Savika Varapon. Dr. Savika Varapon is a lecturer at the Department of Foreign Languages, Faculty of Humanities, Kasetsat University, Thailand. She received a PhD in ELT, English Language Teaching, from Tamasat University, Thailand. Let's welcome Dr. Savika Varapon, the moderator for Webinar 5. Thank you so much, Tanvir, for the introduction. Hi, Sawadiha. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants from around the world. My name is Sawika, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for today's webinar by Asia Travel. Wow, now we have 300 participants and a lot more are joining us around the world. Because I can see um, in the chat, um, greetings from Laos, good afternoon from Philippines, hello from Vietnam, Indonesia, from Egypt, hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and wherever you are, okay. Um, before we proceed further, I have a warm-up activity for everyone, mm -hmm. all right? Um, I will read um, a few statements. I will read a few statements, one statement at a time. If you agree or you have experienced the same, all right, please type the name of your country in the chat box. Once again, I will read three statements. If you agree with the statement and if you have experienced the same, you can type the name of your country in the chat box. May I have the slide, please? Um, thank you. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. The pandemic hampered my research. The pandemic hampered my research. Again, if you agree or if you have experienced the same, please type the name of your country in the chat. Wow. Philippines, Myanmar, China, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, China, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Indonesia, Thailand, Thailand, South Korea, Mongolia, Korea, Canada. Wow. All right. Thailand again, Philippines, Indonesia. Thank you, thank you. From many different countries. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, next statement, please. 
the pandemic hampered my research. However, there is still a silver lining for me to do something different. There is still a silver lining for me to do something different. Thailand, Indonesia, yes, Indonesia, South Korea, Canada, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, from Egypt. Okay, and the last statement. I should materialize a research work from my teaching experience during the pandemic. I should materialize a research work from my teaching experience during the pandemic. Again, if you agree, please type the name of your country. Myanmar, hi from Iran, Philippines, Laos, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Thailand again, Malaysia, Philippines, like this attending webinar. You're right. Thailand, Philippines. Okay. Thank you so much for your kind participation. Well, this is amazing. Um, such a good kickoff, right? The point of this warm up activity is for you to check yourself. Because the thing is, if any of these statements, is relevant to you, you are in the right place. And if none of them is relevant, you are also in the right place. Because in any minute, you are going to hear from the three esteemed panelists of diverse backgrounds. They are going to share the insights and experiences that will help and inspire you in conducting ELT research in the new normal. And this is how the webinar goes. In the first round, each panelist will have 15 minutes to deliver their presentation. And we will end the first round with a Q&A session. After that, we'll then continue to the second round where each panelist will have three minutes to share the final remarks in summing up today's theme. And the theme of this webinar is ELT research in the new normal, opportunities and alternatives, okay? All right, we are now moving on to the second panelist. Um, if you have um, the questions, for example, what are the commonly used methodologies in the new normal? Have these research methodologies been different from the pre-COVID situation and how are they different? You must listen to our, pan to our second panelist. Um, he is an assistant professor in the School of Foreign Languages at Sunshine Technology University. He serves on the Committee of PACCOL International Association and helps organize global international conferences. He also received a number of international awards and scholarships over the years. His latest publications can be found in Computer Assisted Language Learning, Language in Society, Australian Journal of Educational Technology, Journal of Education for, Techno for Teaching, and Web Journal. His edited book, Language Learning with Technology, Perspectives from Asia, has just been published by Springer in 2021. He is currently editing a special issue for the International Journal of TESOL Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Junji Gavin Wu from the School of Foreign Languages, Sunshan Technology University. Yeah, thanks so much, Savika, for the warm introduction. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Gavin. Um, so thanks so much for the organizers inviting me to attend this webinar. It's really my great honor. Um, so first, allow me to share my PowerPoint slides. OK. 
Okay. Um, so can you see my uh, PowerPoint slides? Um, hi, Savika. Yes, yes, we can see you. Right, yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Yes, we can. Um, yeah, yeah, right, thanks. So, uh, thanks so much. So I'm going to uh, further move on the topic of ELT research from based on my research perspective, that is TEL research. So uh, if you are not familiar with what TEL is, so that is technology enhanced language learning. So basically means to use the technology in the process of improving language learning and teaching, both for students and for teachers. Um, so actually in the past 10, uh, past 10 years, we do have seen TEL research is becoming much more important and popular in applied linguistics. So, I, uh, so we can look at this table. There are four representative journals in TEL research. So uh, based on this table, you can see all of them have really high impact factors and they rank really high in linguistics journals, right? So I think this, all these numbers, they have indicated that uh, the rising popularity of TEL research uh, especially due to the pervasiveness of different technologies, uh, not only uh, in the developed countries, but also in the developing countries as well. So, so based on this topic, um, I did a quick review because we're going to talk about the current situation and uh, possibly the future developments. So I did a quick review of the latest articles published in these four journals called Recall LLT, that is Language Learning with Technology, and CoEJ. So what I found is, so still researchers, they have been looking into uh, like different language skills, for example, like listening and writing particularly. So uh, also researchers, they are quite interested in vocabulary research and how teachers may provide feedback or students may provide feedback to each other. And also blended learning, especially because of the pandemic, right? So actually these topics have been popular for the, at least the past five years, but still they are extensively researched uh, in the current era. Um, but in addition to these topics, I want to highlight two other topics, uh, especially in the new, new normal. I think they may be very important to consider for everyone. Um, the first one is virtual exchange or what we call telecollaboration. So that basically means teachers, they try to connect students from different cities, different countries, different continents uh, with each other. They try to collaborate and finish certain learning tasks together. So by doing that, they can exchange the culture, the language, uh, et cetera. So why it is become really important, especially in the new normal, I think it's because of the pandemic, the mobility of students and teachers is highly restricted. So basically, uh, I don't see students going abroad for quite some time actually in my university. So also teachers, we are not allowed to travel abroad. So that actually uh, leaves the question. So how could we still improve students' linguistic and also the cultural awareness, uh, especially for the English language major students? So I think as these two researchers have suggested that so under these circumstances, the virtual exchange has become a really powerful tool for every teacher to consider okay, uh, if you want to keep this mobility going on for your students. So here are actually a few examples I found uh, in these journals. So you can see researchers, they are actually invest, investigating different kinds of subtopics under virtual exchange. For example, like how to teach grammar, how students, they interact with each other, how to raise native culture awareness, right? So actually, I think that is a topic that every language teacher could consider. So maybe you could also explore the other language skills within virtual exchange, right? Um, also, if we look at the research methods in these four papers, so I think half of them, they may use our mixed methods approach and half of them may use of the qualitative research approach which I will elaborate on uh, in a minute, um, okay? So that is the major, the first topic I wanna suggest uh, for you to consider. And the second one is teacher education. This is also, uh, I think, very crucial for everyone. Why is that? 
because I see most of the teachers, including myself, we were educated how to teach language in a physical classroom, right? We were never taught how to design online activities, how to facilitate online learning, how to evaluate uh, in the online context, right? So actually there are a few uh, journals, they are aware of this issue and they have planned special issues actually in, in the upcoming years. Um, so actually there are some uh, broad issues we need to consider okay, uh, in teacher education. For example, how could we deal with different challenges when teaching online? What kind of strategies are there for us to use, right? And how could we uh, support, especially the pre-service teachers to improve their digital literacies? How could we support them to become better teachers who can handle the, the technical uh, elements in their own classrooms? And, and also, how could we make use of the new technology such as virtual reality um, in our teacher education? So a few questions actually for you to think about. Uh, I don't have time to elaborate on, on each question here. So again, here I provide you with uh, some latest examples from these four journals. So again, you can see researchers are quite interested in different aspects of teacher education, uh, especially with the support of technology, like course design, corpus literacy, or teacher cognitions. Um, okay, so actually a, a lot of, I think a wide range of topics we can explore within TEL research. Um, okay, meanwhile, if, you, if we still look at the research methods, so half of them, I think, um, sorry, more than half of them uh, actually made use of the mixed methods approach and only one study used the qualitative one. But again, I mean, I think you can see a, a tendency about the research methods here, right? So actually, I agree with Professor Dorothy Chen. So Professor Dorothy Chen, uh, she has summarized that. So actually there is an important shift in tell research that we move beyond the purely quantitative research into more mixed methods approach and even qualitative research approach. So um, by saying that, we do see that, I think from the two tables, you can tell there are actually a wide range of data sources, not only from the traditional questionnaire interviews, but also like uh, chat transcripts, audio recording, video recording, or WhatsApp messages, so all of this, uh, they have become our data sources, right? So I think my next question is, are there any new changes, especially in the new normal, right? Is it still the same when we conduct interviews? I think the answer is no. There are some changes, even some challenges for us to collect data through digital platforms. So let's first look at the question now. So there are at least, I think, four basic questions we need to consider when we conduct online interview, uh, sorry, online surveys. Uh, first question is, which website should we use? Uh, SurveyMonkey or some other websites, right? So but the website, is it accessible for your participants? For example, SurveyMonkey, I don't think that is, uh, that can be easily accessed in the Chinese context. So if you want to, uh, conduct a questionnaire survey with Chinese students, you may consider use the Chinese website, right? Um, how can we ensure data privacy? That is also a very important question for us to consider. So how could we protect the students' answers? Okay, can others access our data? Okay. Also, how could we get consent from a large number of research participants? That is also extremely difficult in, in the new normal. Right, okay. And also how many items should a questionnaire contain? I mean, traditionally, if we invite students to come to the classroom and they can actually sit in the classroom and complete a very long questionnaire, maybe they can spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes uh, just completing questionnaire. But I don't think that would be highly possible when we do the online questionnaire survey because our patience is, patience is quite limited. So definitely we need to think about, uh, we need to shorten the questionnaire survey, yeah. So that is uh, some question we need to consider about questionnaire. Then uh, let's look at interviews. 
So when conducting online interviews, that is also definitely uh, completely different from our physical interviews. For example, again, the first question, which tool shall we use? I mean, we are using Zoom actually. So Zoom is rarely used in China. So you need to definitely change to another platform actually if you wanna conduct the online interview. And what about Facebook and WhatsApp? Can students access this, these platforms or tools easily? So that's one question. And another question, so when and where shall we conduct the online interviews? So the location and the time are also quite uh, crucial actually. Um, but more importantly, we need to consider, so how long should one interview session last? So again, I mean, in the good old days, we may, uh, I mean, buy students a cup of coffee and they actually, they can sit through the entire afternoon with us, right? Share their thoughts, maybe for two hours, that, is, that should be fine. But in, the, in this kind of online settings, students, they don't get the patience to sit through the long sessions. So how long should one session last? Okay. Uh, finally, so how can we maintain a healthy dynamic between the interviewer and the interviewees, right? How can we build trust and rapport with our students? Okay. So I don't have time to share a story, but uh, I mean, later in the QA session, I may share with you a, a kind of recent example. Okay. Um, in addition to the questionnaire survey and interviews, I also want to talk about online data because I do see there are more and more researchers interested in analyzing online data. For example, the uh, data from Facebook, uh, from uh, po uh, different posts from Twitter or Instagram pictures. So one tricky question I think for many of us uh, may wonder, so whether we should get consent from the publishers, right? So I think a, a general rule is that because the internet is a public and open space. So we don't have to get consent from the publisher. However, however, uh, from my perspective, I think we need to have a, to develop a critical awareness of the challenges uh, the not only the researchers may encounter, but also the participants may encounter and try to make contextual uh, decisions. So what do I mean by that? So let's consider Facebook. So is Facebook really a public space? I mean, maybe for some people, yes, maybe for me, it is a public space, but maybe for another student, that is a private place. So shall we reveal the student's identity? I think we need to consider from the student's perspective, right? And also what about the sensitive topics? For example, like politics, right, religions. So when talking, when analyzing data about these sensitive topics, how could we protect our participants' privacy? That is also a very important ethical issue uh, for everyone to consider. And also vulnerable participants, for example, like kids. So kids actually, they may get bullied if we publish something, maybe we, when we post uh, their comments from Twitter, right? We need to protect the health, not only the physical health, but also the psychological health of the vulnerable participants. Okay, so maybe some, uh, some teachers or educators uh, think, okay, I can just anonymize my participants and that will solve all the issues. Uh, is that the case? So think about actually, because of the development of search engines, a lot of information can be traced, right? So for example, we analyze a YouTube video about the LGBTQ community. And yes, when I published the paper, I blurred the person's face, but you know, there are actually different kinds of uh, facial recognition software. Um, by using that software, you can very easily identify, actually trace back to this video and you can see this person's face, right? So this person may, may get bullied in the workplace, right? And also what about a person who talk about uh, the political stance in Twitter to show we, uh, so yes, when we anonymize this person, we may feel, okay, he or she should be fine. But actually the Twitter post can be traced back by, simple, by a simple Google search. So that are some, I think, very important ethical issues for everyone to consider when conducting research, okay? All 
All right, okay. So uh, next I wanna talk very briefly about how to conduct ethical research because of the time. Um, so, so actually based on Sterling and DeCosta 2018, I think one of the very key principle for, for everyone that is we need to respect for persons. So we need to treat our students as person, human beings, right? We need to think about student labor, emotions, and their personal development. So um, actually, Peter de Costa, he talked about a lot of researchers, uh, they hold this attitude, like who cares? As long as my university says it's fine, okay, I could go ahead to, with my study. I don't care about the ethics anymore. But that is definitely not the issue here. Okay. Uh, also, during the COVID-19, actually, for, uh, from my experience, I heard a lot of students complaining about the abundant time they had to spend in helping teachers um, collecting data. They need to participate in different questionnaires, interviews, um, the, especially the person on, uh, online interviews. They spend a lot, a lot of time uh, for teachers. Okay? So that is actually we need to consider. So how could our research beneficial to students, not only the researcher him or herself, also to the participants, okay? So I wanna end my, my small talk with a, a sentence from Sterling and DeCosta. So they, they say that, so research ethics are constantly ne negotiated and do not stop after research publications. So as I think as a responsible researcher, we need to think about how could we conduct the research ethically before the study, in the study, and after the study. All right, so thank you so much. And that is end of my part. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu, for your resourceful um, ideas on how we teachers and researchers can turn this crisis into a new opportunity. Um, your presentation has helped answer many crucial questions for us novice and seasoned researchers alike. One thing that um, I believe we surely learn from your presentation is that the online platforms are now a new normal for research practices. They can be a research topic, a research um, instrument, or even a research setting itself. And TAIL, which is um, techno technology enhanced language learning, could be applied in various research methods, whether it be quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods with any research design, correlational, experimental, case study, ethnography, or discourse analysis. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. And I am now reading um, the feedback in the chat box, right? Thank you for the wonderful and well-organized presentation. Very insightful presentation. Thank you so much, Professor. Very informative. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. All right, thank uh, you thank so, you so much. much. And if you have, and don't forget that if you have a question, you can drop your question in um, the Mentimeter. The link is now provided in the chat box here worldwideweb.menti.com slash um, in the chat box, okay? And here we come the final panelist. Um, our final panelist is a PhD student at the University of Education, University of Queensland, Australia. Prior to this, he was an academic lecturer attached to the Ministry of Education in Malaysia. He holds a Bachelor of Education in TESOL from the University of Exeter in UK, as well as a Master's in Language Learning Education from the University of Malaya. He was also a former Chief Ning Scholarship recipient and pursued public policy studies at the Department of Political Science, University College London in UK. His research interests include language policy and planning, English language education, medium of instruction policy, 
bilingual, multilingual education, international and comparative education, education policy, leadership and management, and teacher education and teacher professional development. Dear participants, um, please welcome Mr. Lee Huan Yik or Patrick, our final panelist. Hi, Patrick. Hi, hello. Yeah, Hi. Allow me to share the screen first. Is, is, has that been shared? Is it clear? Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I think um, I will start uh, the presentation uh, for this webinar series. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, the organizers, Asia uh, Tafel. Um, uh, so it's my privilege and an honor for me to present uh, my research topic, my doctoral research on language policy and planning, a case study of ASEAN. Uh, but my presentation focuses mainly uh, on the challenges and strategies in collecting data during a pandemic. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in language policy, School of Education, uh, University of Queensland, Australia. Uh, um, my name is Lee Huan Yik. Uh, you can just address me as Patrick. So uh, as you can see here, Southeast Asia consists of 11 countries, um, for those who are not so familiar with that. Uh, and then 10 of the countries are ASEAN member states. Only Timor-Leste has yet to be accepted as an ASEAN uh, member. So, uh, um, well, uh, uh, first of all, we have to understand the context of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, there are 690 million people uh, within this region, roughly, and with an estimated of 1,200 over living languages uh, in Southeast Asia based on ethnologue. So it is a region that is rich in linguistic and cultural diversity. Um, ASEAN itself was first established in 1967 uh, as a regional bloc with uh, five member states, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Uh, later expanding to 10 member states at the moment. Um, so uh, ASEAN has adopted English uh, as its sole working language according to the ASEAN Charter 2009. Um, so that my doctoral research examines how English was adopted uh, as the sole working language of ASEAN, followed by a critical review of the status quo. Uh, data collection methods uh, in this qualitative case study uh, included semi-structured interviews and policy document analysis. My plan was to conduct uh, 15 interviews with social linguistic experts, as well as 10 interviews with key policy actors at the ASEAN organizational level. So um, basically, you have got your proposal ready in my case, and then you were, you were eager to enter the next phase, so uh, which is data collection. And you thought that everything would be smooth sailing, right? And then, well, um, this is, of course, my personal journey. What we didn't expect was COVID-19 struck. And even if you have planned well, you may still fail, right? So what happens now is that uh, you have to go through the data collection phase uh, with COVID-19 raging around the world. Okay, this was exactly how I felt uh, at that time. I think uh, most or many postgraduate students would have felt the same as uh, what uh, Savika has uh, uh, tried uh, to elicit from the participants. Okay, so for example, I felt uh, apprehension, trepidation, uh, anxiety, of course, and then not knowing what to expect, right? It was a very uncertain world and during an uncertain time. And then uh, do I postpone my data collection phase, you know? So uh, am I going to complete my studies on time? Or, uh, or some may say that maybe I will fail my PhD in the end, you know? So uh, that's me on the tight rope, right? So. Uh, with an uncertain future with a lot of question marks right basically more questions than answers uh trust me i've experienced all of those and then uh, i have to think on the spot right and then i think outside the box away from the comfort zone and then try to be a problem solver okay so uh, if there is one meaningful analogy uh, that i want to share that sums up my thoughts at a time then this is it right I think it absolutely applied to our current situation. Let me explain this. Uh, firstly, we are often reminded uh, to practice physical distancing or social distancing. 
So uh, uh, to some extent, we have to mind the gap and then be extra cautious in these pandemic times, right? And then secondly, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, there is now a data collection gap, right? Uh, in my research progress. So I think it is certainly a gap that uh, all of us have to go through. And then I need to fill in the gap, right? No matter how tough it is. Or we can decide to do nothing or just wait for it to be over. Thirdly, I think it symbolizes no way in, no way out. It's almost like no entry, you know, being in a state of pause, right? Or a standstill. Uh, for example, we, have, we are faced with international border restrictions, travel restrictions, border closures, movement control orders, lockdowns, etc. Right? But what is important is how we deal with this and move forward. So, and this is what I do. So I keep calm and mind the gap, right? Just like in the London Underground. Okay, so um, basically, uh, if we were to collect data during a pandemic, this is based on my own experience, there are two fundamental changes uh, in data collection, especially in terms of interviews or online interviews in this case. First of all, I think the key thing here is that there is a transition or a change from physical setting to a virtual uh, platform. Okay. Secondly, will be from on site to online. Of course, uh, uh, Gavin has presented some of this. Okay. Um, basically, both of these do overlap uh, in some ways. Well, because of restrictions, various restrictions, Current scenarios uh, necessitate a paradigm shift, right, in data collection methods, uh, in uh, ELT as well as applied linguistics research, uh, from ethnographic research, on-site observations, uh, artifacts, archives, uh, library documents, uh, field work, right, uh, in-depth on-site interviews, to currently virtual approaches, uh, for example, recorded videos, uh, virtual tools for interviews photos, images, online documents, websites as evidence, etc. Okay, so um, my personal concern for my research was participant recruitment, okay, because participating in a research is actually a voluntary act academic exercise. So what this means is that participants are not obligated to participate, okay, I think there was a chat question that I read just now. So for example, there is no incentive to agree to an interview online, okay, so uh, if you look at physical setting, physical online meetings are different, okay? For example, we can have a meal together, we can share documents, we can read some books. Um, some people even prepare souvenirs, right? When you meet somebody for an on-site uh, on interview, okay? Uh, but as expected, uh, when it comes to online uh, 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 respondents, there might be some who did not respond at all, right? So we were unsure whether they were not interested at all or they were too busy, some of them would have forgotten to apply, uh, re re respond, and then some, perhaps the emails were not sent correctly, okay? So let me share some uh, useful tips because I think this is based on my experience, but some of you may have felt the same. Uh, one initial concern was not having sufficient participants, okay? So uh, uh, my personal tip or my backup plan was uh, uh, always aim for more, okay? There are two rules of thumb here. Uh, uh, in case, there are many who do not respond favorably. Okay, in my case, I believe I'd send emails to more than 50 prospective respondents, and then I was satisfied with a response rate of around 50%, okay? But you never know who respond or when they will respond, okay? For some of them, it may take months, and some may never uh, respond at all, right? But no matter what, never give up, okay? Why did I say so? Uh, there is a caveat here. Uh, I have to emphasize here that uh, all of this happened during the initial phase of the pandemic. Right, during February to April, uh, around that time, okay, 2020. So things were quite different at the time. Many people were practicing a wait and see attitude, a wait and see mode, uh, and they were unfamiliar with technological tools, okay? Uh, uh, these days, it's very different, right? Most people nowadays are more prepared and they're very happy, more than happy to accept interviews online than ever before, okay? So uh, uh, let's look at some of the online tools for interviews. Uh, 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 adding on or moving on from what Gavin has pointed out uh, in, in his uh, presentation. So uh, all of these sound very familiar to us, right? But in the initial days of the pandemic, days when Skype, Facebook Messenger and email interviews were more popular, okay? Just to share, those things were more practical at the time. Uh, at uh, just one and a half years ago, Zoom was about uh, uh, enlarging something, you know, it's a, a vision related word. Okay, Google Meet and Microsoft Teams were Greek to me. Uh, not many people knew about this. 
Of course, the rest, as they say, was history, right? Uh, how times have changed, you know? So uh, once you know all of these tools, online tools, it, it's actually fairly straightforward. You know, uh, conducting online interviews today has become a vital skill for postgraduate researchers, okay? So uh, in this case, I'd like to share uh, certain tips or uh, issues as well as strategies uh, conducting online interviews. Okay, so in terms of issues, I think all of us are well versed with all of this. Uh, internet connection can be an issue. So we need strong and stable connection, needless to say. And then we do need a good and clear audio and visual. And if possible, uh, limited distractions. What I mean by that, for example, there will be some people playing in the background, you know, your family around, and then you have construction sites nearby, you have noise, and then emails coming into the chat box, inbox, and then phone calls, etc. Okay, so all of these are uh, distractions. Um, and if possible, uh, I, I hope that we are able to record the interview session. Uh, this is strongly encouraged, but of course, uh, consent should be given, or, or you should ask for consent from your interview respondents, okay? Because so that you can focus entirely on the interview itself, uh, because transcribing can be quite hard work, okay? Uh, so let's look at some strategies, okay? Uh, if possible, give the respondents or participants the interview questions beforehand, okay? Uh, uh, this is to save time and hopefully you can get better and quicker answers and sometimes more direct answers, okay? Because uh, as Gavin pointed out, some people may not uh, like interviews for a very long session, right? And then uh, you also give participants time to prepare before beforehand, okay? And then they will have a background knowledge and background context of the session, or what the session is all about. If possible, prepare yourself in front of a laptop or in front of a mirror before the interview. I think uh, this helps you to visualize the scenes in your head and in the mind, because uh, to gain confidence, uh, let's face it, uh, we, we, do, we do have butterflies in the stomach and people feel jittery, uh, uh, but with practice, uh, you can be more positive and you can present things better uh, uh, So uh, during an online interview. And then i just like to share some online tools uh, uh, um, which are useful uh, as well uh, for transcribing as well as for translation, okay? So uh, uh, I'm sure all of you know that uh, on Google, you, we, we, we do have uh, auto translation uh, um, and then auto transcription. And there is one uh, free transcription software called Otter, okay, which I find useful for transcribing uh, uh, interview data. And then uh, definitely we are, there are many advantages uh, uh, in terms of uh, conducting interviews online. First of all, I think I actually reached out to more participants than ever before, okay? Previously, some of the participants were impossible for me to reach because of time difference, because of distance, because of transport limitations, costs incurred, and so on, right? For example, I managed to interview participants in the US, in the UK, in Ireland, and parts of Australia, okay? Uh, uh, and then, um, of course, some people do feel uh, uh, nervous in front of, uh, uh, when it comes to face-to-face -face meetings, okay? Uh, or one-to-one -one interviews, but online and virtual platforms make it more convenient and comfortable, and uh, uh, it's easier for us to break the eyes as well. That's what some of us find. And then um, I think uh, uh, when it comes to online interviews, we can do it anytime, anywhere. So it's quite flexible, okay? You don't have to meet the person face-to-face uh, -face physically. So the only thing is to make sure is to get the time zone right, you know? I think that that is very crucial. And it's very convenient when it comes to logistics uh, arrangement, okay? For example, you cut down a lot on uh, logistics costs, transport, accommodation, food, time, uh, uh, and waiting time as, as, as well. And definitely is also a COVID safe measure, okay, uh, by conducting on online interviews. Uh, last but not least, I think it's easy to cancel or reschedule a meeting online, okay? Not much time or money uh, uh, spent in that case, okay? So uh, um, last but not least, uh, I think uh, uh, we've come to the uh, conclusion. So overall, I think uh, the whole experience can be just as effective uh, when you conduct interviews online. I think, uh, I believe it's the right decision at a time when I made the decision to conduct virtual interviews during uncertain times, right? So I leave you with these two quotes. I think in, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. Uh, Winston Churchill mentioned something like that as well. So uh, I think uh, that's it. We have to embrace uh, these differences. Uh, I will leave you with that. Uh, thank you very much. We survived the COVID test. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, yes, I agree that change is inevitable. And the true intelligence is that the ability to adapt to change. And you, Patrick, you have demonstrated an excellent ability to adapt your work to cope with the unexpected situation, right? Yes, um, yes, with, yes, with no yes. doubts, um, we benefit from an online tips and guidelines to kindly share with us. And so once again, thank you very much. And we hope you will very soon enjoy the fruits of your efforts. Patrick, thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are now approaching the Q&A session. You can drop again your questions in the Mentimeter link provided in the chat, okay? Um, the webinar team is gathering all the questions from um, the link, all right? Well, let me see the question. Okay. Um, question, okay, this is for um, Professor Shahid. The question is, um, okay, um, student motivation is also my issue in my classroom. My question is how to, ex tough, how to examine this issue? Do you have a suggestion for me to analyze my students' motivation in my curriculum classes? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, that is, as I mentioned, that's an excellent question. And that's a very common question uh, that we think about, or um, uh, probably you have uh, thought about, uh, you know, I'm talking about all of you have at some point. And um, so a lot of time, uh, this issue uh, or uh, learner motivation is, um, is, um, is seen, um, I mean, in a very, this, I mean, the bad news is that we don't have any specific instrument that we can use to measure whether our students are motivated or not. People depend a lot on visual cues, uh, like they see students are smiling. Okay, well, my students are very interested if they are happy. So those are <clears throat> those are indicators. But they, 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 uh, if you look at learner motivation, that's a very complex and 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 multidimensional uh, aspect. And uh, so I'll try to be very brief because this is such a big topic. <coughs> so. I would say that I have, um, um, like I, the article I shared with you, that's the, uh, one of the latest uh, and the most impactful uh, framework that we use in L2 motivation, that is L2 motivational self system by Dornier. Um, that, so that has been a very impactful model. So I, what, I, what we have done, my quotes and I, we have, uh, we have offered um, some new directions, how you can, what you can focus on when you're trying to look at learner motivation in EL, a global EL classroom uh, with, with, the, with the three perspective. So because I, I don't have time to explain that what we, uh, we offer. So that's like one way I would suggest that you can take, uh, one direction you can take. And um, uh, in addition, if you could Google search, uh, I have published earlier another article uh, on, in TESOL, a TESOL journal on, uh, that was actually the, the study that I, I conducted in an actual classroom setting where I tried to measure uh, what was the motivation intensity of my students and uh, what were the motivation orientations of the students and, uh, and I used and developed an instrument. So that, that could be another uh, probably a very practical uh, hands-on kind of uh, tool that you can, you, you might like to use. So I, I and, and, and in, in, in addition to that, there are uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, resources uh, or, or books available, uh, especially by if you probably you'll see Donier name always appear when you, when you try to uh, look at learner motivation. So um, probably you can you can uh, you can buy and read those books as well. So so these are some of uh, quick tips that I can offer in like uh, in, in 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 one minute. Um, thank you, Professor Shahid. Um, dear participants, Professor Shahid will be one of the plenary speakers at the 2021 Asia TEFL International Conference to be held in India. If you haven't registered for the conference, you can still do it, okay? Um, thank you so much, Professor. Well, Welcome. we are now moving on to um, the next question. The next question is for Dr. Gavin. 
Um, okay. It is fascinating to know several types of instruments in the pandemic era. Could you give me some examples of the instruments protocol, such as chats, um, any theoretical, any theory behind? Mm -hmm. okay. Right, yeah, thanks so much for the question. Um, I think there is no particular, no particular theory that you can just, I mean, use, right? So you need to think about your research questions, right? So for example, you're thinking about motivation. So you may use Donnie's theory. Um, and for, uh, for me, I particularly use the social culture theory to investigate students' interactions in the online community. So I find that particularly uh, useful uh, as a theory, but also in the meantime, I would try to incorporate different kinds of, um, not only the theoretical uh, underpinnings, but also the methodological uh, constructions. For example, I made use of a new kinds of um, methods approach called uh, netnography. So that is uh, actually a, a, a method, sorry, approach, an approach that you is quite popular in business studies, but they use that approach in, how, in analyzing uh, like Twitter, uh, Instagram, how they influence the business promotion. So that actually, I think that also fits fit with my research goals. So I also incorporate that into my studies as well. So I wouldn't suggest a particular theory to, to any teacher. I have to say, you need to consider, you need to align the, the, uh, the theories with your research questions. So I hope that helps. Um, of course, thank you, Dr. Gavin, for your answer. Thank you so much. And um, this is going to be the last question. Due to the time constraints, um, we have to apologize as we have, as we can only afford a handful of questions, right? Um, Patrick, this one is for you. What were your key considerations when working on making amendments to your research methodology? Um, yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, I think there are a few things to consider. Of course, uh, definitely you will need uh, to discuss this with your uh, supervisors, your advisors. And then uh, also, I think you have to look at your timeline because uh, I think at that time, uh, most people thought that you know, COVID-19 pandemic was going to be just for a few months and then that's it you know so so some people say we we'll just wait for it and then we we'll still want to do it face to face you know we we'll still want to do a physical uh, at a physical setting and things like that but uh, uh, I think uh, as time you know went on uh, most people realized that uh, the, we are going in for a long haul you know so uh, that's when uh, we realized that yeah uh, I think it's important to always have a backup plan even uh, uh, my, my personal take is that even if there is no COVID-19 pandemic, there might be something else, you know, so, so it's always good to prepare, you know, uh, uh, anticipate. Uh, uh, so I think uh, it's important to have a backup plan in case this doesn't work, then plan B or plan C. I think that's, that's how the world operates these days. So, uh, but again, uh, for some people, uh, they might be a bit uh, unfortunate in the sense that they have to rescope their uh, uh, study or research and then they may have to go through the ethical clearance uh, part again. So, uh, but don't worry. I think that's uh, usually uh, fairly quick because uh, uh, people understand that uh, these things happen. And then uh, I think uh, if that's uh, what you have to do, I think just go through it and then rescope your study uh, to something more manageable and then uh, more practical. And then if you think that uh, you need to do everything virtually and do it online, uh, once you have decided on it, just go with it, you know, uh, um, uh, stick to it. I think it's possible to do uh, a research fully online. I, I think uh, it is possible, but it requires planning. And then uh, uh, just uh, make sure that uh, you plan things well ahead. And then uh, uh, just hope that uh, things work out, you know, uh, according to plan. Definitely there are different issues uh, that may come with online uh, uh, research tools but uh, it's inevitable in a pandemic. So I think uh, there are certain things to consider, especially like uh, uh, internet connection and also logistics uh, and, and so on. But I think if you were to do 100% online, you have less uh, uh, to, to 
to think about when it comes to logistics. So I think that's something that is very helpful when uh, doing research virtually. Um, thank you, Patrick. Um, you remind me of one quotation. Um, if the plan doesn't work, change the plan, but never the goal. You remind me of this um, quotation, and I do love um, this quotation and your answer very much. It's really inspiring. Well, we will now end the Q&A session. Once again, my apologies, as um, we have um, a very limited of time, right? We will proceed with the second round of the webinar. Okay. I always believe that words can influence us, inspire us, or just easily bring us to tears. Wise words can change your life forever. This is what I always believe. And in this second round, our panelists have their final remarks regarding the webinar theme to share with us. Well, let's hear from Professor Dr. Shahid first. Professor. Thank you. Uh, I would say that research has always been a, a complex, um, and challenging uh, professional activity, even before pandemic. So it is something that is um, that has been uh, very demanding in many ways. So it demands very uh, very advanced skills. Uh, it demands a lot of uh, time, resources, uh, and of course uh, dealing with uh, different pitfalls, as as uh, my fellow panelists have pointed out. Uh, that has been the same situation with research even before. Okay. But with this pandemic and this new normal, uh, that has added additional layers of, of challenge and complexity to this uh, already a complex uh, um, activity. So it's, it's hard to capture all the complexities like uh, in, in for every situation. So I think there are a lot of things that happen in, in, in different contexts and every context is unique in many ways. So I would, I would say that based on that, it's, it's important just to be, but be, just be prepared that what before uh, thinking about or before embarking on any uh, any research project or when you're conceiving and thinking. So that's why I one of the uh, key strategies that I emphasized before was that to, to collaborate so that you have other people with you on the same journey. And, uh, and uh, based on my experience, and I always found uh, uh, that if I, I, I accomplished some research projects that I could not have done on my own if I didn't have my collaborators or, or, or co-researchers with me. So that is a, that's an important resource. And, and of course, that also has its own complexities and challenges that how to find reliable and uh, competent collaborators uh, who can support and, and if they're interested in your work too. So could that's, uh, that's, so these, these webinars or these uh, professional events are great opportunities that when we can step, step out of uh, the world that we live in and maybe collab, uh, connect with other people. So uh, uh, that, I, I would say that forging uh, collaboration or uh, partnerships and, and uh, is, is a key strategy for the success or, uh, of any research project. When we think of research, another, the, the last thing I would like to emphasize is that a lot of time we have an end product in our mind, right? So we are working on a research project and we would like to, we would like to disseminate, disseminate those results uh, in the form of a publication. And when you think of publication these days, that's a huge uh, thing or concern for a lot of people. There are new uh, requirements, what kind of publications, or I mean, there's uh, some other big topic that we can talk about. Uh, and uh, so when we think, it, and, uh, and, and, and we get to the publication, I'm, I'm currently uh, uh, editing a special issue of system. Uh, there's mention of system uh, as well. So I, I, have, I have had various editorial roles before. So uh, I'm familiar that how uh, interested people are in, in publishing. So when it comes to publishing, manuscript is submitted and that a lot of effort goes in submitting that manuscript in a, in a quality journal uh, or quality publication. So, but that depends on how the research was done, whether all the conditions and how research was designed, how it was planned, how it was executed. Uh, and, um, and, and, and a lot of times there are, there are issues with the different stages. And, um, uh, and so uh, in, in that sense that 
uh, making sure that every stage uh, from uh, planning, uh, designing, uh, implementing, uh, analyzing, and interpreting, and discussing, and so forth uh, in research is uh, all the all the requirements are fully met. And again, in that sense, if if you, if, you, if there are one more than one persons or researchers involved in that, they they basically uh, they, they 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 make like a huge likely to make this the project to 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 a success and and to a, that optimal level that uh, anybody would like to achieve so that's like one uh, point i would like to emphasize and um and, and and at the end i would just say that that yes it is uh, research has always been doing quality research has always been challenging and uh, doing quality research has always been resource intensive uh and uh, that was that was even before pandemic but now with this pandemic we we got extra or additional on, or, or more more or new form of challenges to to that something which was already very complex so with that note i'll just stop here and uh, uh, I, uh, I i take this opportunity to like to say a big thank you to all of you for your your participation in this webinar and giving this opportunity to to, to talk to you uh, and in particular i'd like to say thank you to dr savika varaporn uh, Ms. Tan Tanbir uh, Sekhan and uh, Dr. Shinyu Chai uh, 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 and, and Professor Pragasit and uh, Professor Ju Kyung uh, Park uh, and, um, and 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 T Asia Temple presidents uh, uh, Professor Kli Young uh, uh, Lee and uh, Professor uh, uh, Ravinder uh, Gargesh. Uh, thank you very much, and it was a pleasure and honor honor to be part of this conversation. Thank you, the pleasure is ours. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Shahid. And um, I believe it's almost 3 a.m. in Canada right now, everyone. Well, thank you, thank you so much for tonight. Okay. Well, Dr. Wu, Dr. Wu, um, how about you? Um, we would like to hear your final thoughts regarding um, the research methodology in ELT research, do you have anything um, that you would like to add from your um, presentation? Yes, um, so I do see some questions asking about how uh, to conduct the online interviews, especially during the pan new, sorry, in the new normal. So I wanna share, I mean, a, a story. So I recently conducted uh, the uh, online interviews with a student from Hong Kong. So uh, the topic we were actually talking about is the use of taboo language. So like the use of F word in his, uh, in his digital gaming experience. So we actually, my collaborator and I were quite worried whether, because I mean, we, we only met him like once. So we were quite worried whether he would be willing to talk about his experience of using the taboo language. So actually, what we do, what we did was, we actually, we separated the long interview session into, uh, into three short sessions. So each session lasted around 30 minutes to 40 minutes. And the very first five to 10 minutes were, were actually used um, for small talk. So we exchanged like personal stories, okay, recent news in, in your life. So actually by doing that, we did find the research participant became quite, I would say, active in sharing his use of languages. So, uh, and also we, we do find that the student was not exhausted at the end of each interview session. So that is one story I wanna share. Um, but finally, I prepare actually uh, a Twitter post for everyone to, to enjoy. Uh, so I have to share my screen again. So this is a Twitter post from Professor Joseph Corpet, who is the chief editor of Computer Assisted Language Learning. So Professor Corpet, he posted that Cole will never publish any articles with COVID in title, abstract, or introduction. The journal is not interested in the so-called emergency teaching approaches. So we only want to look at how you improve your teaching through uh, different kinds of methodologies, okay? Or the teaching approaches. So what I want to highlight at the end of uh, the webinar is, so I, I come to aware that a lot of researchers, they are trying to conduct research, especially and highlight 
COVID as their one of the major feature in the paper. But I would say, I mean, as a, as a reviewer for different journals, I would not suggest you put COVID in, especially, I mean, as the only feature in your, as your, in your paper. So that would not attract reviewers actually. Uh, I think that would even cause some uh, negative impact when we review the paper actually. So we are more interested in like the different pedagogical approaches that every teacher can apply no matter what is the context, no matter the time. So think about how to generalize the research findings beyond the COVID-19 or post the COVID-19. Um, so that is, I think my suggestion uh, as a reviewer actually for different uh, journals, um, okay. So uh, finally, a, a little bit kind of self-promotion. So I recently edited a book. So if any of you are interested in how we can use our different technologies, so you are always welcome to check out this book. Uh, I think we've in included lots of leading uh, researchers across Asia. All right, so I think that's all I want to share. Okay, Savika. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kevin. Well, give me 30 seconds, all right? Um, let me delete the word COVID from my recent research paper. Okay, 30 <laughs> seconds, I will, I will be back. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, and Patrick, um, I think some of our participants are now pursuing their PhD, and some are considering doing one. Do you have anything um, you would like to say to them? Hello, hello. Yes. Uh, well, uh, um, I would say just embrace. Uh, uh, VUCA as a way of life, VUCA as in like volatility, uncertainty, uh, um, and then ambiguity and complexity. Uh, don't be disheartened if your PhD takes longer or you have to change your data collection methods. Or uh, for some, perhaps their data collection process is delayed, right? So uh, remember, you are not alone. I mean, uh, I think just now some people pointed it out. I think we are all in this together, you know? Uh, and then I dare say that, uh, um, there, even if there is no COVID pandemic or whatever you call it, uh, there may be other kinds of uh, issues that you are facing, you are faced with, and we may, we still need to reform and adapt to changes, right? I say that because uh, change is the only constant in life, you know, and uncertainty is a new certainty. <laughs> you see, so uh, no matter what, uh, we we need to ch have a change of mindset, embrace the new normal in carrying our research, okay? Uh, but I find that there are certain positive aspects that. Uh, uh, we should uh, uh, at least discuss or at least point out, right? I find that human beings uh, can evolve and survive. You know, we have this natural instinct, okay? Uh, uh, we rebound, we can come back stronger, we persevere and we accept changes. We adapt to changes, okay? Uh, perhaps this is the kind of instinct that we have, you know, survival of the fittest. So uh, for those who, who are interested in reforms or education change and things like that, Maybe uh, 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 Who Moved My Cheese is a good book that you can read or you can watch the, the video clip. Um, and it's, it's about how we can adapt or react uh, when we are faced with changes in life. Uh, and another positive aspect that I think uh, that comes out from this is that uh, there are more and more uh, technologically enhanced data collection methods that we can use. Uh, even conferences and supervisions uh, are now nowadays done uh, online you know, for many uh, in many circumstances uh, and in many situations. So uh, this is like making the impossible possible. Okay, uh, and of course, I think nowadays we are uh, ever ready, you know, to face the next pandemic or whatever disaster it may be in the future. Uh, and uh, one more positive aspect, uh, I think, learning from experience is that. Uh, uh, there are more and more professional learning communities coming up, okay, on virtual platforms. And then distance learning has become more fashionable. And then uh, there are more and more massive open online courses that you can explore. So like people are collaborating and helping each other out, uh, uh, quoting what uh, Professor Shahid has mentioned. Okay, so data collection, uh, uh, last but not least, I think uh, does not need to be fully on site. I think that's one thing that uh, we have to accept uh, these days. And then it can be done fully online and it might be you know, uh, uh, as uh, uh, efficient, okay, if not 
uh, 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 helpful and useful for us to achieve our goals and to, to collect our research data for our PhD or master's research or uh, if you're doing postdoc or whatever, okay? Uh, uh, I just want to share one uh, uh, phrase. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a Mandarin word or a Chinese uh, uh, a word. It's called uh, a crisis, the word crisis. When you translate it into Mandarin, it's called Wei Ji. Okay, Wei means danger and Ji means uh, chance or opportunity. So behind every danger or in every danger, there is always a chance and opportunity. I think this is where, where the webinar uh, theme is very apt, right? Uh, we always talk about challenges, but also alternatives and strategies, okay? So I think I will end with, uh, on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very wonderful. Thank you so much, Patrick. And ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the end of the webinar. Once again, a huge thank to all our three panelists for their valuable insights regarding um, possibilities and alternatives of BLT research in the new normal. Thank you to all participants, wherever you are, all the best and stay safe. I would now hand over the session to our MC, Ms. Tanvir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Savika Warapot, for doing such a great job as the moderator of the day. And a sincere thanks to the speakers for your wonderful presentation, your contribution and your time. Of course, thank you to our wonderful participants who actively engaged with this webinar with lots of questions. Now, I would like to invite Professor Pragasit, the advisor of Asia TAFL Webinar Series 2021 to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Tanbir. Sorry, Krab. Greetings from Thailand. First of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy that the Asia TEFL webinar series captured a lot of attention from a wide range of audience all around the world. Without your support, the webinar series wouldn't be a success. This webinar is the fifth one and is the last one for this year. In each webinar, there were around 400 to 700 participants, which is the last number. Because of the last number of the participants, we have tried our best to make it better every time in order to meet your needs and objectives in joining the webinar. Actually, the aim of this webinar series is to provide Asia TEFL members and English language education advocates and practitioners with an opportunity to engage in issues and developments in English language education in Asia and all around the world. The series will be an avenue to share current and new developments in English language education with members and their regions in the interest of mutual development. So the webinar series will still continue next year, okay? We hope that uh, the first webinar for next year will start in March. We will keep you uh, posted. Before we end the webinar, I would like to wholeheartedly thank the speakers and the participants for your valuable time and participation uh, to make this event successful. My special thanks also go to the Asia TEFL presidents executive members for their support and useful suggestions. Finally, this webinar series project wouldn't be such a great success without the hard work and good teamwork of the Asia TEFL Professional Network Webinar Series Committee from Thailand, Malaysia, and Korea, who have tirelessly invested lots of time and efforts in running a series of the webinars. Thank you very much once again. I hope to see you again next year. But before that, don't forget to join the 2021 Asia TEFL International Conference this coming December in India. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you very much, Professor Pragasit. As uh, we have mentioned several times, uh, this is our last web webinar for 2021. Therefore, on behalf of Asia TEFL webinar series, I would also like to thank all the participants, uh, speakers and committee member members for the support throughout the five webinars that were held this year and making Asia TAFL webinar series 2021 a success. We will update you about our future webinar series in 2022 
via our Facebook page, Asia Tafel Association, and website at www.asiatafel.org. Just a quick reminder that our fifth and last webinar for the year 2021 isn't finished yet. We will let you know soon about how to get an e-certificate. But before that, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our Asia TAFL Professional Network Committee members who worked behind the webinar series 2021. Let's see who they are. Give us a moment. Thank you. Professor Pragasit Sipiko, Chai Zun Yu, Dr. Sabika Warapon. Fiona Sada Gopan, Kitipat Chuti Chawirat, Norhazrin Anwa, Kitichai Nilubu, Professor Hik Yong Lee, Dr. Hesi Ha Aslam Khan, Tanvir Kosekon. Dr. Zaira Abu Hassan Shari, Grace Chang Siu Yang, Lukman Mai, Datin Dr. Raja Mazwin Aziz, and Dr. Ali Ahmad Zaman. So these are the 15 committee members from Malaysia, South Korea and Thailand who have worked together to ensure the webinar series 2021 is conducted successfully. Well, everyone, we are almost at the end of the session. We would like to spend a couple of minutes to take a group photo before we open up the form for e-certification. If you please, if you would please turn on your cameras and give us your beautiful smile. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. All right, thank you very much, we are done. Thank you very much. Now it's time for e-certificates. As I informed you earlier, we are happy to issue an e-certificate to all of you who have been attending this webinar. As you see on the screen, the link and the QR code are displayed. Please use your device to either enter the link or scan the QR code. This will direct you to an e-form where you can put your details in. Please note, the e-form is now open and will be disabled after 15 minutes. So please complete it now. We are also here with you to answer your questions about e-certificates, should you have any. Our e-certificate is computer generated based on what we have keyed into the form. Please ensure that your email address is correct and all the spaces and dots and symbols are correct. This is to ensure that we can send it to the correct email address. Please be sure that you write down your name and your email address clearly because we will not be reissuing any e-certificate in case of spelling errors. So please double check your name and email address before sending it to us. That would be much appreciated. Your certificates will be emailed to you within three weeks. 
once the e-certs have been sent, we will send out a notification email to everyone who registered for the event. You will need to let us know by a certain date, just in case you do not receive your e-certificate. Please be patient as we are taking time to ensure accuracy. Thank you. For those of you who have completed the form, well done. You will receive your e-certificate within three weeks. This is now the end of the session and the Asia TAFL webinar series 2021. On behalf of Asia TAFL Professional Network Committee, we would like to thank everyone once again for your participation. Hope to see you next year. In the meantime, stay safe and take care. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.